Hi, this is Julie Levinsky, and I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar about applying for a quality of life grant. I also want to ask if everybody can hear me, if they can type yes in the audience chat box. We did recently switch to a new webinar platform, and I want to make sure that you all can hear me. Wonderful, thank you. Yay, all the yeses. Fantastic. So, um, I, again, I want to welcome you all, and I want to um, now bring in our presenters, Mark, who's the director of our Quality, and Life, uh, Quality of Life Grants Program. Before I do, I want to remind you that if you have a question to ask, to please use the um, ask a question box, which is located above the audience chat box, and then we'll uh, be able to see it, and we can hopefully get to all your um, questions before the end of the presentation. So now I'm going to send it over to Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Um, as Julie said, I'm Mark Bogosian. I'm the director of the Quality of Life Grants Program here at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. And uh, I, too, would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar about applying for a quality of life grant. Um, you know, this cycle, we're offering both uh, direct effect grants and expanded effect grants. And I'll, you know, certainly talk about what those are. And um, I just want everyone to remember off the bat that the deadline for application submission is March 16th. So that's kind of uh, kind of an important date, and it's at 11:59 p.m. Just uh, the way the system is. Um, all grants must be completed within 12 months after the receipt of the awarded funds. So, what how we see this cycle is that the grants will start um, on June 1st, 2020 and close on May 31st, 2021. Um, you know, there might be a little wiggle room based on our external review and awarding and all of that, but those are currently the dates that everyone should plan to uh, start and complete their projects. Um, you know, something that I think you all are aware of, but I just, you know, do want to share it with you all that, um, you know, we're no longer able to provide individual pre-award assistance, either by telephone or email, and that's, um, you know, through our um, our cooperative agreement with the uh, federal government. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, too. But what we do say is that we welcome you to submit any questions that you have about the application process, and please submit them to qol at christopherreeve.org. And this email will show up a few times in the slide, so you'll see that as it comes up. Um, all questions that uh, are submitted either now or through February 14th, which is this Friday, um, will be collected, aggregated, and answered in a question and answer uh, document that's going to be posted on our website. We're also asking everyone is, uh, I'm sure you can see there are a few questions already in the chat box, and we're going to hopefully answer those questions along the way, and then at the end, let us, I'm always saying let us hope uh, that there's time for uh, a little uh, Q&A time. So just remember that the, the deadline for these questions to be included on the question and answer document is this Friday, February 14th at the end of the day, and application submission is March 16th. So for those of you that may have joined a webinar before, um, I, what I want to do something a little different this time. What I really want to focus on, and, and the reason why I want to do this is because a lot of this information is provided in the program and application guidelines. So that's all there for you to read and take a look at. So what I'm hoping that we can really accomplish for this webinar is to talk more in depth about the funding restrictions, eligibility, and information on budget specifics, and kind of things that we've seen that have either, you know, kind of knocked people out of the race or have, you know, kind of maybe brought their score down. But before I talk about that, I just want to say that also in the application guidelines, 
we've added scoring rubrics and a copy of the application review form that the external reviewers will be using when they're reviewing and scoring your application. So this is going to allow you, hopefully, to uh, better understand how your applications are being evaluated. So I really you know, urge you to look at the application program guidelines that are on our website because it will have all of that information. Um, so just quickly, I want to talk a little bit how the grants are selected because people often wonder. So, you know, we as a staff really have no involvement in the, you know, choosing awarding of those grants because they go out to an external review committee. The applications come in, and as I'm sure some of you are aware, we, you know, there are times we, we receive up to 400 applications or so per cycle, and, you know, with the amount of funds that we have available, we're able to award last cycle we awarded 54. So, you know, you can see that the external reviewers get a large number of um, applications that they see, and they are, again, they're external reviewers who are either experts in the field, you know, they could be doctors or lawyers or um, even people living with paralysis or caretakers or people that are do in respite programs running those. So the, the idea is that, you know, the role of the external reviewer is really to bring an informed, objective, and unbiased perspective to the assessment of the application. So they review them for a number of you know, areas which you'll, you know, see in the application guidelines, but, you know, project design, project reach, you know, how, you know, how many people are going to be affected that are living with paralysis, how are the target audiences identified, you know, there's also a piece for project evaluation, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but another thing that they look at is organizational capacity, you know, does the applicant organization have the capacity to carry out the project as proposed, so, the reviewers go through, uh, you know, all of the criteria that we're now also sharing with you so that you'll see really what they're looking and how they score them. So the scores come back and, you know, there's, uh, you know, they're scored from zero to 100 and, you know, there's a cutoff and, you know, the, 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 the higher ranking scores then go to another type of uh, internal review committee which then look at the comments that have been provided and there's discussion around those and then they are awarded. So um, just briefly I wanted to touch on that because I think it's important for people to know how that works and how the really the external review committees and their scoring play such a, a major role. So that's why we've this time provided you with that information. So. I am, as, uh, as Julie said, this is new technology, so I'm hoping, ah, there's slide two again. So here's an overview. You know, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, a few of these things in depth, and some of them I'm just going to go over kind of quickly. Uh, you know, the Paralysis Resource Center I just want to touch on, eligibility, funding restrictions, allowable expenses. We'll look at both grants programs and then go through things which I think is really important too, like accessing the online grants portal. Um, and then, you know, just briefly go over application process and what happens after that. So, um, we are paralysis focused, obviously, and with that, our grants must be targeted to projects that serve individuals living with paralysis, their families, and caregivers. And we use a functional definition of paralysis, which is the difficulty and or inability to use arms and legs due to a neurological condition, such as, and, and not limited to, but spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, ALS, post-polio syndrome, et cetera. And while we'll consider supporting programs that include people that have other types of disabilities, you know, cross disabilities, um, as well as inclusive community projects, proposed projects really must serve a majority of people living with paralysis. So if you're proposing something to us and there's, you know, it's mostly non-people 
you know, people with not living with paralysis that are being served, that is something that would not be, uh, you know, looked on favorably. Um, and you must serve at least a, a minimum of three individuals of paralysis, um, you know, as defined on this slide here too, um, and or their families and caregivers. And so, you know, in a case like nursing home transition or a respite caregiving program. So we, um, the, the Quality of Life Grants Program is part of the Reef Foundation's um, National Paralysis Resource Center. And we have been funded, the, you know, the National Paralysis Resource Center has been funded since 2014 through a cooperative agreement with the Administration for Community Living, or ACL. And you'll hear me referring to ACL a lot. Um, and, you know, the National PRC provides deeply needed information, programs, and individualized support and assistance to, you know, the over 3 point, um, sorry, 5.3 million Americans living with paralysis. Um, and I just want to go through this really quickly. Uh, you can find this information, too, on our website, but I think it's so important to note um, because I want you all to be aware of the services that we offer to you and to your stakeholders. So in the National Paralysis Resource Center, we have information specialists who provide one-on-one -on -one assistance uh, through phone calls and emails. And the people that are served through that are people living with paralysis, those who are newly injured or newly diagnosed, or those who have been living with paralysis for 20 plus years. It can also be family members or friends who have questions any question, it could be about insurance, it could be anything that you have uh, you know, a question for, a family member has a question for, and they're able to guide you through the process and answer that. We have a military and veterans program, we have peer and family support program, um, we have over 380 certified peer mentors who have supported up to this point over 11,000 people, which is really amazing. Um, there's Reef Connect, which is a private forum for our community, so go to our website, sign up for Reef Connect, all of the different um, you know, different um, communities are listed on our website, and there's also um, us, the uh, Quality of Life Grants, and as I said, we're funded through ACL, and um, up through our last grant cycle, we have just awarded over $28 million to about 30, you know, 3,150 programs. And then just lastly, the National PRC provides free health-related resources and materials. And I really, you know, urge you to go and um, look at these resources to share either, again, with your stakeholders or, you know, with those that you are working with. And they're all free. Our paralysis resource guide, there are wallet cards on secondary medical conditions such as sepsis or deep vein thrombosis. There are brochures on bowel and bladder management and a whole other, you know, all other issues. Fact sheets, sheets where to find information within your state. So please go to our website and, um, or, you know, reach out to us and we'll certainly provide you with these free materials. Um, before you begin your application, we recommend that you read the application and program guidelines, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, they provide information about the grants programs, about program and funding tier descriptions, there's always an updated eligibility criteria. Um, there are funding restrictions, allowable expenses, as well as the application questions. And I mentioned this time we've also added the um, external reviewers scoring rubric and the, the questions that they have when they look at your reports and how they go about um, scoring your uh, applications. Um, also on our website, there's, um, you know, obviously the overview of the QOL grant process, the QOL grant application process. That's included as well in the application guidelines, but if you go to our website, there are pages dedicated to that. Um, also, I do want to say this is kind of important. There's, um, there are a few publications that I really recommend you look at, and one is called the People First Language Guide. Um, those are guidelines for discussing people with disabilities, and 
you know, one of the things we hear from the reviewers is, and, you know, certainly for us as a foundation, we want to refer to people living with paralysis in a positive and non-limiting way. So it, um, you know, there are times where uh, an application will come in that it will use something, you know, words like wheelchair bound or, you know, something that's kind of negative or limiting. And so looking at these types of guidelines that we have, you know, and we, you know, we urge you to talk about people living with mobility issues, you know, as, a, as opposed to wheelchair bound. So um, just, you know, think about that. The language is important and, um, you know, especially for organizations that are out there working in this field, it, it really would benefit all of us to, to continue to use positive and um, non-limiting language. Um, there's another document on the website that I really would like you to look at, and it is a quick guide to establishing evaluator um, evaluation indicators. And the reason why we want you to do that is because the grant application requires you to describe evaluation indicators um, that you're going to use to measure the success of the project. So the indicators, uh, you know, must be a combination of both input and output indicators and must be measurable. So you're going to also be asked how to describe them, you know, describe the methods that you're using. So you could use surveys or interviews or focus groups or a review of prog uh, program documents. But again, do look at that because that is a major piece, especially with the um, expanded effect grants that we're awarding. Um, that's a huge component. So let's talk about eligibility. Um, again, one of the most important things, and I actually see the, the first question in the queue is, you know, can a municipality, can municipal communities apply for this grant? So yes. Uh, quality of life grant applicant applications are accepted from nonprofit organizations, municipalities, and tribal entities. Um, something that really needs to be, um, you know, said is that your organization must be the 501c3 nonprofit organization. Fiscal sponsors are not allowed to apply on behalf of either a non-501c3 nonprofit organization or a for-profit organization. So your organization itself must be the 501c3 organization, um, you know, unless you are a part of a chapter of, a, you know, a national organization, um, then, you know, then you still are a 501c3. Um, there's been some question in the past and about prior grantees, and you know what we say is that prior grantees are encouraged to apply for new and innovative projects. Um, however, funding requests for continuation of projects that have already been funded through either the direct effect or the high impact priority tiers that are not expanded effect because expanded effect, as we will talk about a little bit later on, is all about, um, you know, funding previously awarded programs that have achieved demonstrable success and shown great impact. Those we would be replicating. Um, the reason why we want to say that is, and uh, this is the example that's coming to mind right now, but, you know, if you're, let's say, a wheelchair dance company and you continuously come back to us for the same program, you know, one thing that we and the, the federal government also do, don't want is for us to, you know, be the sole provider for your organization. So, you know, it, it also helps you to, you know, expand your funding by, you know, using other organizations and not just relying on Reed Foundation funding. However, we also know that there are some programs, let's say like nursing home transition, that you have an excellent program that is evidence-based and showing results, and you, you know, you, you, why would you want to do something new and innovative, right? Be, and, and I mean, certainly you would want to, but I'm saying that, you know, you have something that works, you're bringing it back for funding, those will also be um, considered, you know, based upon the merit and the success of the past grant program. So, you know, again, not to say that if you're a wheelchair dance company, you know, don't come back to us for the same program. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that as an example, it really is 
something uh, to, to come to us in terms of kind of new and innovative, but we understand as well that there are tried and true programs that work and do deserve funding if you know, funds are available. So um, organizations that have been previously awarded a quality of life grant in any category um, may reapply for funding one year following the close of your grant and notification of grant closure by the Reed Foundation. So if you have any question about that, please just you know, contact us at qol at christopherreeve.org. Um, you know, and we can help you, you know, if you don't know exactly when your last grant closed, we can help you figure that out. And um, multiple submissions from one organization will also not be considered. So organizations may only apply for one grant in a grant cycle and only under one tier. However, as I mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, chapters, you know, more than one chapter of a national organization may apply for a grant in the same grant cycle. Um, special consideration will be given to proposals that um, serve current military and or veterans and their families, as well as any of these groups here that are on our underserved groups. Um, so please take a look at that. You know, those are, uh, again, special consideration will be given to projects that do uh, assist these underserved areas. Funding restrictions. So I apologize if I've been going a little fast because these are kind of the areas that I really want us to focus on uh, during today's call. So um, based on our and in accordance with our federal cooperative agreement, uh, the Reeve Foundation is prohibited from funding the following. And there'll be a number of slides here and I won't really touch on everything because they're here. They're also in the program guidelines. They're on our website. but grants awarded to individuals. And we've kind of want to explain that a little more. So it's not only grants that are would be directly awarded to individuals, but it would include any expense that would be seen as a gift to an individual. Examples of this would be, let's say, a ready bag for disaster preparedness. Or if you're applying uh, for a camp, it would be t-shirts. Um, that would not be uh, an allowable expense. Jerseys and uniforms, um, you know, you could come to us with the greatest adaptive sports program, and if you're only asking for the uniforms, unfortunately, that is something that we are not able to fund. Um, home modifications. Um, in the, you know, what would be different would be facility mod modification. So if you're an organization, a nonprofit, that is fine, facility mod um, modifications, but not home modifications because that would be, again, seen as a gift to an individual. Um, For-profit companies, we, I touched on that earlier. You need to have your own 501c3 tax determination status. Um, and no organization that acts as a fiscal sponsor is, um, you know, allowed to apply. Uh, organizations and projects that are based outside of the United States and projects that utilize contractors or vendors outside of the United States. And again, these are all in agreement uh, with our cooperative, uh, in accordance, actually, with our cooperative agreement. Um, research is not fundable, and rehabilitative therapy, but I really do want to talk about this a little bit because programs that assist people living with paralysis to help them ex uh, participate in exercise opportunities are allowable. So programs that use physical or operational therapists to work directly with persons with paralysis, that's considered part of rehabilitative therapy. However, if what you're providing is an exercise opportunity that's facilitated by someone who has a bachelor's degree in exercise science or is a certified fitness instructor, that would be an allowable expense. Um, equipment. So there's a little confusion about equipment, and I hope over the next uh, you know, two slides or so we can kind of clear that up. We're not allowed to fund equipment except in the following three areas. And one is equipment is allowable 
if you are running a loan closet. Otherwise, again, in any kind of equipment that's given to an individual to keep, that's considered a gift to an individual. So requests for loan closets, they have to have a specified period of time. And generally, based on our work with um, the state AT programs, um, a device loan is typically four to six weeks. Sometimes we can, you know, push that up to nine weeks, which would be three months. And this enables the, the people that are, you know, that are receiving the loan equipment to try them out and to familiarize themselves with it. You know, and it could be assistive technology. It could be a, a parts of a smart home or, um, you know, eye gaze equipment to help people, you know, that are unable to speak use their eyes to communicate um, or durable medical equipment. So it allows them to try it out before acquiring it on their own. Um, so any um, application that comes to us with open-ended or long-term loan closets will not be considered. So just really think about the, you know, the length of your loan closet and what your policies are and share those with us so that we can you know, also assist you. And you know, that also applies to ramps. You know, um, we have some programs that do portable ramps. You know, uh, you know, if you were to set up a ramp at someone's house, unfortunately that's considered a gift to an individual. If it's a portable ramp through a loan closet, that is allowable. Um, and again, a ramp to a, you know, a facility, let's say a, a, a museum or so, that would be acceptable because it is not, um, that, that's offering access to uh, an, a, a building. Um, again, with equipment, and I just used the word access, equipment can be funded if it provides access and or uh, promotes independence. So here are two examples of, of kind of what that means. So adaptive strollers that are used as part of a program that are not given out to the individuals but remain on site, that is providing access. Um, a transfer chair at a community pool, a stair lift, that is something you know that gets you from one you know up a few steps to the to the next few steps or one floor to the other. And I'll talk a little bit about lifts in in a moment. But um, gym equipment that is providing access, um, however, not equipment that you would have a physical therapist or someone in the medical profession who needs to guide you through that process because then that would be considered um, therapy. But again, if it's gym equipment and it's part of that other aspect that we were talking about earlier with therapy, which you know, we're not allowed to do, but um, exercise uh, opportunities, that provides access. Um, an examination table in a rural area where no such equipment is available in that region, that is providing access. Um, one example that I use here for promoting independence, because you know, generally you wouldn't think of this, but you know, a scale, right? Because knowing your weight promotes independence because it allows people to remain healthy, uh, because we all know being overweight can lead to a myriad of chronic health conditions, and especially living with paralysis, you know, there are a number of issues that can, that can happen. So beach wheelchairs and adaptive, um, adaptive bikes at a community park or, you know, sports wheelchairs for community team, you know, those also promote independence, even though I would say, you know, they really fit under providing access too. Um, We'll talk very quickly about nursing home transition in a minute because it's really not part of this program, although if you're applying for an expanded effect grant and you had received a nursing home transition grant prior, you know, we'll talk about that. But that is the only case where equipment could be purchased, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Development of prototypes uh, for invention of equipment, anything that has to do with intellectual property rights research, we're not able to fund. 
Um, construction, and this is another one that I really, really want to focus in on because the number of proposals that we get for these types of uh, constructions or modification, um, I really want to help people better understand. So, you know, we cannot fund construction or what's considered major construction. What we can fund, though, are simple accessibility modifications to existing structures. So, existing structures is really the key word there. So, you know, playgrounds or trails or in the next um, you know, bullet, I talk about a simple bathroom, you know, accessible bathroom modifications. Um, so, for example, you know, you're allowed to do bathroom modifications if it's an existing bathroom. However, if you're building on to a, you know, a part of the building to make an accessible bathroom, that is not allowed. That is considered major construction. Um, allowable expenses under, let's say, the, the bathroom modification would be a grab bar, you know, grab bars or accessible toilets or accessible sinks. Um, and again, I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, uh, the building of a new bathroom or in major, major renovations of the existing bathroom would not be allowable. Um, another example, oh, and I, and I had touched on this just a very, very briefly, but you know, requesting funds for an accessible lift or an elevator. And this would be allowable under equipment that provides access and promotes independence, um, but we cannot fund the excavation or construction of the elevator or the elevator shaft because that would be considered major construction. And the way, you know, we and um, our, uh, you know, our funders through the cooperative agreement ACL kind of look at this, you know, lifts and elevators are generally, you know, kind of, and I don't want to say simple plug-in devices, but, you know, they help you get up a few stairs or from, you know, one floor to another. It's something that is very easy. You purchase and you, you know, kind of set it up. It's not you're excavating the shaft, you're building, you know, anything, again, that has that kind of major construction feel to it will not be considered. Um, we talked about projects that must serve at the very least three um, individuals. Any type of fundraising event or paid fundraiser positions, uh, lobbying, any effort to influence legislation, um, projects that cannot be completed within the 12 months, or projects that have already been completed. So, you know, this grant pro is going to start in June. Uh, you know, the awards will, for the projects will start in June. So, you know, we ask, please don't come to us asking for a project that ended in May. So, you know, we're not able to fund something that's already happened. Um, you know, and we put food here, and I, you know, the, again, one of the things that we see a lot is, you know, people will put in for meals or even water, and, you know, those are just expenses that through our cooperative agreement we are unable to fund. And lastly on this list here are medical services. Um, you know, so allowable expenses, you know, what, what are the allowable expenses? I would say pretty much anything and everything else. We're really looking at um, a, a wide range of programmatic expenses, uh, which, you know, could be anything uh, like personnel, consultants, contracted workers, entry fees, transportation costs, facility rentals, travel reimbursement, marketing, equipment, um, and again, you know, keep in mind the funding restrictions on equipment, but, you know, supplies, that also. Um, and just here are some guidelines that, you know, we have to adhere to through our cooperative agreement in terms of how much we can pay for travel. So, you know, airfare is limited to $500 for a round trip, train 275, hotel at 225 a night, and mileage can be reimbursable at uh, 57 and a half cents. Um, and again, I equipment and supplies. What I want to do is when we get to it, we're going to go through the budget and, um, and I'm going to show you certain aspects of this uh, through the budget worksheet. 
Um, here's where we're, again, very briefly, if you are applying for a nursing home transition, and this would probably only end be through the uh, expanded effect, as you know, right now the high impact priority nursing home transition grant is not going to be happening until the fall. Um, this is where you could buy uh, things such as a stove uh, that people are able to access, or a washer and dryer, anything that helps people transition out of the nursing home into a home, or that allows them to keep from going into a nursing home. So if you have any questions about nursing home transition, please reach out to us and we're, we're more than happy to talk you through that. Um, so one thing that really, I, I, you know, we want to, we want to uh, express because uh, the number of proposals that we receive, uh, you know, you, you would be surprised. Um, so please be specific and your funding requests. And the example I give here is if, you know, if you're requesting funds for an accessible playground, be specific in the proposed budget. Indicate the pieces of equipment. Is it, you know, an accessible merry-go-round for $9,000, a swing for $8,500, you know, or, you know, part of the process, poured rubber playground surface at $12,000. And you please include a vendor quote um, That'll back up each specific budget line item, and you know, under this kind of area, and make sure that the vendor quote is up to date. We've received vendor quotes that are a year old or older, and you know, they need to be vendor quotes that are up to date that will be still in effect if the grant is awarded. You know, what we what we please do not do is request a blanket $25,000 and let's say your overall budget is uh, $430,000 and you just say $25,000 for an accessible playground equipment. We don't know what that's going towards or what you're going to do with it or even a you know, building modification. Please be very specific um, and as I said, the quotes must be current uh, during the time of submission and they are strongly recommended for all equipment and services. So um, this year, 2020, we're offering um, direct effect grants, which are the open focus uh, grants up to $25,000. And again, I will, I will definitely go into some specifics on these. High impact priority will not be given um, until the fall and then the expanded effect, which are the grants of up to $100,000, and those are for the previously awarded QOL grantees um, whose programs and our projects uh, have achieved demonstrable successful impact. So um, direct effect quality of life grants, as, as, you, as you can see, there's, it's a wide range of projects. It could be anything from accessibility modifications, adaptable sports, advocacy, assistive technology, um, consumer education, caregiving, um, fitness and wellness, peer mentoring support programs, service animal uh, programs, uh, therapeutic horseback riding, transportation. So, you know, really, it's very wide ranging and it, it covers anything that is really going to have a direct effect on people being served by this grant program, you know, by your, you know, by your program that you're proposing. Um, you know, examples here, you know, sports wheelchairs for a wheelchair basketball team or electric door openers at a community center, a hydraulic lift at a pool, um, you know, support groups, uh, camp programs, peer mentoring programs, um, you know, just really it, wide ranging and um, again, just really showing that it has direct effect on the people being served. So expanded effect, um, who can apply? These, uh, as you know, are for the previous awarded organizations that are in good standing with the foundation. Good standing really refers to that the grant has been successfully closed out. A final report has been submitted on time, meaning that we're not, you know, three months later still, you know, 
you know, where's our final report? We haven't submitted it yet. So, you know, we really love to be in communication, too, with our grantees during the project and afterwards. You know, I think that it's important for us to have that kind of communication. So, um, you know, the, you know, that certainly is uh, a part of it, too, just really a program that has also expended all of the grant funds related to what the budget was. They've shown um, impact. They have are ready to be brought to scale. So they can, you know, be on a state and an, or in a region or in a new location or additional settings. Um, you know, one thing that I would really urge you to do is to, and I'm going to change the slide right now to, you know, here's what are expanded grants. But also I would suggest really going to our website and taking a look at, you know, the projects that we funded before. And I would say the same thing, not only for these expanded effect grants, but for any of the, you know, the direct effect. See what we funded in the past. Um, you know, that's always a good indicator if you're thinking of a similar or even a new type of project, or if you see something on there that hasn't been done that you think really is going to make um, an impact. However, that would not be the case with expanded effect. Um, and one of the things I do want to mention with the expanded effect is that we really do encourage you to um, request the full $100,000. And again, this is really to um, bring your program to scale um, that, that, that really has shown prior evidence of effectiveness and positive results. And in the whole purpose of this, again, is to improve the outcomes for people living with paralysis. And again, their families and caregivers, either through respite care uh, programs and you know, other programs that are focused on families and caregivers. Um, you know, we say here, too, that the um, they extend the services and access and the expansion of effective solutions. So again, this is really taking a program that has worked, that has results and has really already made a difference and is ready to be brought to another level. Um, again, what makes a successful foundation grant is um, you know, programs that promote expansion, innovation, best practices or promising practices or evidence-based practices. Um, they're projects that directly impact the lives of people living with paralysis. So now I just um, want to move into this area. And as we talk about this, you know, how to access the grants portal, then we're also going to talk a little bit more, again, about budgets, because I want to show you there's a budget template that's in here, and I'll, I'll go through that with you to, uh, to show what we have. Um, so the quality of life grant applications are completed online through an online grants portal. Um, this grants portal is available on our website. It's also with embedded in the program and application grant line, um, you know, grant application guidelines. And we're asking you, please, please, please add QOL at ChristopherReeve.org and administrator at grantinterface.com. Add those to your acceptable email lists because once you submit your application, we, those are the two ways that we uh, you know, reach out to you either if we have questions, if there's a question, you know, on the budget that, it, you know, or there's just, you know, something that we need to get in touch with you, this is how we do it. So please make sure that those are um, added to your safe uh, acceptance lists. Um, after clicking on the link to access the Reef Foundation grant portal, you're going to be brought to this logon page. And if this is your first time applying for a grant, you're going to need to create a new account. So you're just going to click on the uh, Create New Account button, and you're going to be asked to input confirmation, um, contact information um, about your organization. Um, and if you need any assistance, there's a, a link to a registration tutorial on this page. Um, also. QOL at ChristopherReed.org, and we can help you any, you know, any way that we can. Um, if you've applied in the past, just please enter your email and the password that you previously used. Um, if you've forgotten your password, 
click on the forget your password link and an email will be sent to you with your password. And if you don't remember or have access even to the email, um, please ask us, uh, qol at christopherreed.org. Um, the one thing that we ask you not to do is n do not create a duplicate organization because the organization that's listed in there has all of your history. So it has all of the grant funding, all of the history, and that information is also used by the um, evaluators to determine, especially if you're doing a um, expanded effects grant. And please also provide more than one contact because what happens is, uh, and it certainly does happen, is you know come interim time where you know there's a six month report due, we send out reminders and we don't hear anything, and then uh, you know it's another month and then a month goes by and you're out of compliance and put on an out of compliance list and you know we when we can finally call and get in touch we you know we will hear oh well that person left so it's really helpful to have more than one contact in there so that we can you know have more than one contact at your organization again it's just really helpful um, so once you've created a new account or logged into your old account on the portal, you're going to be brought to this Apply page, um, and you will just click on the Apply button, and you're going to be brought to the type of grant that you're applying for. And just a reminder here, because it says it there, submission deadline is Monday, March 16th at 11.59 p.m. Um, once you click on the application button for a specific gr grant program, you're, you're going to be brought to the application itself um, to print out the application because um, it's just I think it's really helpful to kind of print it out. It'll print it out in a Word document. Um, you go up to the upper um, right-hand corner. There's something up there, and it says Question List, the button. Um, the Word document will be downloaded, and the application questions are also they're available in the Grant Application and Program Guidelines. Um, the list of application questions, it includes paragraph counts, um, limits for the text fields, and I do, I do know from talking to people that a lot of people do find it helpful to first write the draft in Word, and then you can cut and paste your answers into these online fields, and it just really is you know, much more helpful. Um, you know, I just do want to go back to this. So uh, please re respond to all the questions um, and noting that, you know, any field with an asterisk is a required field. You can save your application at any time and go back to it. And once you've hit, um, once you've completed it, uh, hit that submit application. It's that blue button down in the bottom right hand of the form, and that will submit it. You'll then receive a, um, a confirmation from us. Uh, here is just an example of you know the types of questions that you're going to be asked for, and you'll see that it says something you know like 3,000 characters is a limit that you're given for certain. Another could be 10,000 characters. 3,000 characters is about one page of a Word document. So uh, anything with a 10,000 uh, character limit would be about three pages. And we do not require you to use all of the characters. We just want you to know that the system is going to limit it at that, and it won't let you go uh, beyond that. And again, that's uh, really about all about the system. So. This is just a basic view of what the um, project budget template looks like, and in a few slides I will, you know, kind of go more in depth to it. But I just wanted you to look at this. Um, you know, we ask you to type in the budget line, the total cost of the line item, and the requested amount. Um, subtotals and total costs are going to automatically formulate because that's in the uh, in the Excel sheet. And you know, here are the areas you're going to see. You're going to see personnel costs, equipment, consultants, contractors, uh, supplies, travel, and other costs. Um, then you'll be looking at an area that is going to ask for other sources of funding, and it's going to ask you to note if it's 
committed or pending. So when we go through the example, I'll show you. Um, and then this last little box here, everything's going to pull down from what you've already entered and just kind of uh, formulate there. So you don't really need to do anything. All of the budget lines will pull down for you. So here's an example. Um, this is an organization that came to us for you know whatever their project was. The thing I want you to see here is their total project budget is $465,000. They're asking us for $25,000, and they have listed their personnel costs, and they've broken it out that this is a program coordinator at 5% full-time. Their total cost is $3,000. They're only requesting I'm sorry, $2,000. So it's helpful for us to see what the total cost is and the requested amount and if there were ever any questions, you know, we could go back and they'd say, oh, you know, we're, we're doing an in-kind donation of $1,000 for that person's um, salary or another foundation is uh, funding a part of it. You know, so that helps us know what's the full amount, what are you asking for? Um, and again, here under equipment, you'll see that, the, you know, this top line for uh, the, the zip track, uh, they're, that's the full amount, and they're asking for the full amount. Um, they're telling us that vendor quotes are attached, and there's an upload button for that. The next button, um, budget line is a you know all-access merry-go-round. Total cost is a little over five thousand. They're only asking for two thousand. Again, um, it could be because they you know have other funding, or they're just you know wanting to keep this at the twenty you know which is all that they're really allotted under this grant program, but the $25,000. So you'll see um, this is extremely helpful for us to see both, especially in personnel costs, who's doing it, what's the percentage of time, what's the total, but how much are you requesting from us? And the same with salary. Um, I don't know if you can see, though, up on the top of that, but uh, on the top where it says the total cost of the project, uh, you know, of the pieces is 29,000, and they're asking us for 25,000. So keep in mind, remember, that the original budget was for, I think, 465. I looked down also at the uh, other proposed uh, sources of funding, and I see that there's a lot committed, and there's some pending. You know, does that raise a question with the external reviewers? Uh, what I would say that the external reviewers would see here is that this is an organization that has, uh, you know, it looks as if they're doing a, a playground. The playground is 460000 They have both committed and pending cl very close to the 437000 that they're asking for. They're asking us for 25000 Are is what they're asking, um, you know, allowable within our grants program? Yes. So this gives them a full picture. If there was nothing in the other sources of funding and we knew that the project was $400,000, um, that would probably be scored, you know, lower uh, because there would be no other sources of funding so we give you the $25,000, what's going to happen with it? So you also need to be able to show through this form that um, any type of funding is really going to be usable in that period of time and that if it's part of a larger, larger project or even a larger project, um, that there are funds there in place for the project to take place. And sometimes, yes, the 25000 is the total project budget and you know, we supply the, you know, award the $25,000, and that's fine. Um, you know, or if it's a $25,000 program and, uh, you know, the $30,000 program and you're asking for twenty five, dollars but you're not showing where any, you know, that there's any other sources of funding, that wouldn't be too much of a, you know, a, a red flag. But if it was a, you know, $60,000 project and you're, you know, you're only, you're not showing other sources of funding, that might raise some questions. Also, we ask for you to please do a budget narrative. So, um, you know, again, with the personnel costs, it was the program manager, I believe, in the last example. You know, 
tell us what does the position do? What, how is it going to, um, you know, further the project? What, what are the specifics behind it? Um, anything that is in the budget, please make sure that it's addressed in this budget narrative. So all the expenses should clearly relate to the project budget and, you know, also to the project narrative that you, you know, that you've talked about under what the, the whole project is. So for us, what we find is that the budget narrative, it really helps us get a better understanding of what the grant funds are being used for. Um, so it, that is a, an important piece to please, if you have any questions on the budget narrative, again, reach out to us at QOL. Um, at ChristopherReed.org. Same with the um, same with the, the budget. Um, once you respond to all the questions and you upload the required documents, hit the submit button, which we saw earlier, and I mentioned that a confirmation page is going to um, pop up. Oh, okay. And I just got a um, a note that. We're scheduled to end um, in five minutes. <laughs> so let me see if, and I don't know what just happened to my slides. Um, oh, Mark, your slides should be back. It's Julie, and I added I, more time. You can oh, go over. Okay. Excellent. Well, you know, and I apologize that we're, we're, we seem to be running over. Um, oh, okay. I see how I get to the slides. There we are. Okay. Um, so if you're able to join us, please do join us. We, you know, we're, we're extending this time, and I, I guess really going forward, what I what I really learned from these is that we do need to schedule these for more than an hour and a half. Um, so just quickly, um, here is the you know the calendar uh, deadline for questions are this Friday. Proposals are due in uh, Monday, March. 16th, we have the review periods and the grants. Uh, you should be made aware of them by, um, at the very least, by the end of May for the pro, you know, for the projects to start on June 1st and go through May 31st. Um, award notification: Everyone is notified by email if their application has been approved or declined. Um, and if your project is awarded, you're going to be asked to indicate your acceptance of the grant by an email. Once that's been received, you're going to receive a um, then the grant agreement that will be issued, and the grant agreement must be countersigned, uh, and then the grant check will be issued upon receipt of the countersigned grant agreement. Um, we're also going to provide you with press release template to help you publicize the award and um, just you know, to know that we regularly feature our, our grantees on our website, on social media, in our newsletter, et cetera. Um, something that's really important to know is that um, there are two mandatory uh, reports. One is a midterm, a six-month, and one is a final. And those are really going to help us um, know what's happening. Um, you know, is the is it is the project on track? And if not, like we we always ask, please, you know, share with us, be honest, let us know, because this way we can help. You know, we can help get it back on track. We can get some technical assistance to you, or you know, connect you with folks in the field that you know that might be doing similar projects or that have done similar projects in the past. Uh, you know, what we really want is for your project to succeed. So. Um, the interim report is a really important report to us because it lets us know how it's going. Um, and, you know, just uh, again, we, we not only share this information uh, with our own board, but we do share it with um, ACL uh, and uh, other organizations to, uh, you know, to let them know what's happening uh, with the federal funds. Um, and then a final report is due one month after the close of the grant period, and that's what really details the, the progress, challenges, um, how the challenges were addressed. And, you know, one thing I, 
I, I know it sounds crazy to say, but I love reading the challenges because that's how we learn. We learn from, you know, if everything's going great, that's wonderful. And, you know, that we, we really do like that. But, you know, we learn through your challenges. So if you're facing this challenge, that means another organization somewhere down the line is probably going to face the same challenge. So if they come to us with a similar proposal, you know, we'll be able to say, hey, have you thought of this? Or let's think about this because one of our past grantees had this issue. How could we be proactive? So again, we really do. Challenges, um, how they were addressed, uh, and lessons learned. I don't have it written down there, but you know, that's something else that we'd love to hear from you guys. What are, what are the lessons learned? What have you learned? Um, it, it's, it's always so much more than what you think you're going to do or learn from the, the grant. Um, we'll also occasionally do site visits, um, you know, which can either be just you know, for us to learn more about the program, or if you are having problems, it's a chance for us to go down and you know, see, you know, again, how can we assist? How can we help uh, you know, get the project back on track? And at the very end, there's an evaluation which is made uh, in part by Vanderbilt University, and it really allows you to offer candid feedback about the entire process. I, I, I think there are even there are even questions about this webinar that'll be you know, what, did you find this helpful? Did you did you not? Was it you know, it, it'll just kind of be the whole experience for you. And please, we always ask you know, be honest because that's how we learn. So um, you know, I for one am thinking this is just so much information. I'm talking so quickly. I'm really, you know, going to, you know, make this in the future an hour and a half or so just so that we can make sure that everybody is aware of the time, is able to put aside the time, and questions can be answered. Um, so, again, evaluation really important to us because it helps us grow and helps us serve you better. Um, two things that I do want to mention, uh, grant closeout, you know, to successfully close out the grant, you need to, again, turn in your reports, uh, show us what the outcomes were. The financial report must indicate that all of the funds have been expended. Um, and then after we review these, uh, you know, unless we need other information, then we're, we'll send a, a, a grant closure notification email letter to you. Um, but something that I do need to say is that you know there uh, there may be situations in which the foundation reserves the right to terminate a grant. Uh, you know if the the project is no longer in um, you know within our funding parameters, or if there's you know failure to comply with any of the terms or conditions, like uh, submitting the reports, or there's been you know gross negligence in terms of spending, spending on budget line items that were not approved, um, you know, always come to us and, you know, that information will be, you know, within the award letter too, but, you know, just any kind of changes, please come to us, talk to us, talk to them, uh, talk to us about them, because, again, we want to help you. We don't want this to be a, a bad experience or a negative experience. Um, However, if the grant is terminated, you know, there's the chance that you're going to need to return the funds or any unused funds, and, you know, uh, unfortunately there are repercussions to that, such as, uh, you know, the organization can be reported to the IRS or to uh, the Office of Inspector General and certainly to the Administration for Community Living, um, and then any terminated uh, organization is barred from uh, receiving funding for seven years. But again, what we try to do throughout the entire process is have an open line of communication so that that never happens. You know, we just ask, please communicate with us. That's really, you know, what we want and why we're here. Um, you know, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier uh, about helping uh, define a program, but also just in adherence with our Federal Cooperative Agreement, we're unable to comment on the, any denied application or, you know, you know why it was denied. Um, just because uh, that's seen 
as providing feedback or giving any kind of direction as providing unfair advantage over other grantees. So, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure you can imagine if we receive 400 applications and 54 in the cycle are funded, we're really not able to respond um, efficiently to anyone. Uh, you know, but again, part of our cooperative agreement is that we're really not able to um, anything that indicates providing unfair advantage over other applicants. So I, I do want to say thank you. I know we've gone a little bit over. I want to try to look through the question and answers, and I have to admit, this being the first time, I've never, I haven't done this and this is in a very different format, but I'm going to, if you don't mind hanging in here with me for a little bit, um, I'm going to see if I can answer some of these questions. Again, if your question isn't answered, um, we are certainly going to uh, collect it, answer it. Uh, if there are similar questions, aggregate them, put them together. Um, your, your, you know, so your question will definitely be answered. Um, Yeah, you know, and sometimes these questions, <laughs> they're, they're a little, they're, they're it's, uh, so this, I, I, this is a great question, but I don't, I don't think that I could actually answer it right here, and this is um, Kate Farrell. Um, Kate is asking, one of your guidelines that indicates you will not fund rehabilitative therapy. We are considering submitting a proposal in which occupational therapists would be working alongside assistive technology therapists to train people with paralysis and independent living skills. Would that be eligible? So, Kate, I would actually, you know, I'd like to learn a little bit more about what, you know, what that means, but what I would say is that would be eligible because it's an, it's an occupational therapist who is not providing, uh, let, let's say, you know, medical kind of therapy. So, you know, this is one of those areas that we'd need to understand a little bit more. So, Kate, if you could, um, uh, if again, this is a new system, so I'm not sure I know how to flag this, but if you could send that to the QOL, I will make sure that um, it gets individualized attention also, um, because it's a great question, but it's very nuanced. Um, you know, if, and, and I could talk about it for a while, but it just, you know, so let's see. Um, oh, yes, okay, so maybe we apply for a project that was submitted to the foundation once before but not funded. Absolutely. And, you know, please, you know, a, a, a declined grant does not mean, seriously, does not mean that your project was not a, a good project. You know, as I said, with, you know, 400 applications and they're all ranked um, and scored, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, the cutoff was uh, an 86, then this was an 85, and a different cycle, it could be a 90, you know, so please do resubmit. Um, every cycle is different, and there have been there have been number of grantees that, you know, have been declined two, three times that have come back, and then they're funded. So it, it all has to do with, you know, the amount of money that we have available for the cycle and the other, you know, applications that are coming in. So please, you know, do not feel that, um, you know, that you, that you cannot come back. Um, somebody asked, can you please provide examples of past grants that were awarded? You know, some of the examples that I gave about what is awarded can be done. I would also say that to, to um, you know, please go to our website and look at the previously funded grants. Um, that's, that would be really helpful. Um, sorry, I'm, just, I'm still trying to... Some crazy button just popped up. <laughs> um, is that is that it? Oh no. Okay, I didn't think so. It looked like there's a million. Um, yes, our local government governments such as park districts eligible. Um, yes. Does the Reeve? 
Foundation make capital grants? No, unfortunately we do not. Um, do children youth qualify as an underserved group? You know, I think that's a great, um, and, and Hannah Fields, you asked that. I think that's a great question. Um, I really feel that I, you know, personally would feel that they are. Um, it's surprising, uh, you know, the number of, you know, un, let's say, camp-related or, uh, you know, sports programs or, uh, you know, parks, uh, playgrounds that are not geared towards uh, children and youth. So programs that do, um, you know, focus on children and youth, um, they're certainly, um, I want to say, novel. Um, they're not an underserved area, but I would say that because of the number of, let's say, projects that would that do focus on children and youth, that those generally are something that um, are, are well received. Uh, okay, so I don't. So someone's asking about the a playground um, that is accessible to children and others in the community that are paralyzed. Would this qualify? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that is always helpful in um, playground applications is um, sharing with us what the um, you know what the population statistics are, um, and that helps. And you know, something else to think about is that um, you know accessible playgrounds not only in terms of children, but for caretakers, parents that are, or grandparents that are living with paralysis or in a wheelchair, is the playground accessible to them? So, um, you know, we, you know there, there have been a number of playgrounds, one that was recently awarded in the last cycle that really did focus on both aspects of the, you know, the child and, uh, you know, kind of elderly person, whether it be a grandparent or, you know, anybody at the at the playground that is there to connect. So um, yes, absolutely. Um, again, you know what we you know what the external reviewers do need to see is what you know what are the demographics and uh, you know of the area, how is how is it providing access? Is this the you know, are there accessible playgrounds nearby? Is this the first in the region? I mean there's still Num numerous places in the country where, you know, there are not accessible playgrounds. And um, okay, just to ask a question: What about a program that uses rehab therapists in a hospital setting to help hospitalized patients get out of bed and have mobility, obviously the mobility opportunities, so that? A hospital stay can be reduced in discharge. You know, unfortunately, no. That would be that would not be eligible. Um, that would be seen as really rehabilitative therapy. Um, you know, if you know if any of these restrictions do change in the you know in the future, um, you know, we will we will certainly update everyone and let them know. But that unfortunately would be in an area where we would not be able to do. Um, what about a horse mounting portable ramp? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, even, you know, a lot of the therapeutic horseback riding programs do come to us asking for, you know, for lifts um, or, you know, mounting ramps. So that, that certainly would, um, you know, again, you know, you know, please show us. You know, what are the what are your what are your demographics? What are your what are your the numbers of people that you're serving? All of that does play a big um, role in all of this. Um, but again, anything providing access and um, you know, you, you could certainly say that therapeutic horseback riding through you know house uh, portable ramp mounting, etc. is is um, not only uh, providing access, but you know, supporting and creating independence in some ways because you're helping people strengthen their their core strength, etc. 
Um, please clarify if providing access equipment remains on site. Is it then not loaned, but grantee, but grant purchase? That is from Veronica Murray. Veronica, I'm sorry, I don't really understand that question. Um, if you could send it to me um, at QOL at ChristopherReeb.org, then I can, um, you know, take a look at that. Um, would evacuation chairs manned by EMTs to facilitate the safe and fast removal of wheelchair patrons from a performing arts center in an emergency be considered a, an allowable expense? Um, you know, I would say yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's there. It's um, at an organization. It's providing access. Well, you know, it, in the event that something. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Some of these, as you're reading them here, there's a lot of thinking that, <laughs> at least for me. Um, so we're, I'm just going to try to get through maybe one or two more um, kind of looking. Are sidewalk systems, walkways considered construction projects? You know, again, that depends. Uh, as I said, like a ramp to a, uh, you know, a building, if it's part of, let's say, an accessible trail that you're uh, making the the sidewalk more accessible, um, then it would be considered uh, allowable. Um, I'm just not sure in, in this, you know, it, it, the, it, with the question uh, as it stands, really, um, you know, what the details would be. So, Michelle, if, uh, Michelle Goodrich, if you're still here and you want to pass that on to QOL. Um, uh, somebody said, so converting an existing non-accessible trail and accessible trail. Um, yes. So converting an existing non-accessible trail to an accessible trail would certainly be um, allowable. Um, and we, we have done that many times. Um, again, I, um, I see that we are... Uh, you know, we're, we're at about 20 minutes past, and I've gone way over time. Um, I, I really want to thank everybody. Uh, I apologize for, for going over. Um, we're going to gather all of these questions and um, respond to them. They'll be posted on our website, you know, very shortly, um, hopefully by the middle of next week. So, you know, once the deadline is on Friday, if you get them in before then, we're going to start answering them. Post everything as soon as possible, um, you know, so that you'll all have your answers. Um, and again, if there are questions that you think of after this, please send them to qol at christopherreeve.org. And uh, I really, really want to thank you. Um, it's It's always... It's always great to see these questions and to share this information with you because truly what we want to do is make sure that you know, everyone succeeds so that we can serve the largest number of people. Um, and again, as, as I you know, mentioned earlier, with our you know, very limited funds, it, it may not happen the first time. It may happen the first time. It may, you know, it, but you know, please do consider coming back to us and um, we learn a lot from you. So thank you for your applications. Thank you for all the incredible work that you do. Um, and thank you for taking time. And if you've spent this extra time with us, uh, thank you. And have a great day.